Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for 2023 RJI Open House. My name is Christina, and I'm the Training Programs Associate at Striver, and I'm really excited to meet y'all today. Uh, please know that this meeting is going to be recorded, and you will have access to the recording and the slides after this session is done. And so today we hope that you leave here with a better understanding on who Shriver is, the work we do, and most importantly, the Racial Justice Institute, and what to expect if you decide to join us this year. We'll dive deep into what the RJI experience is, what to keep in mind when applying for the Institute, and you'll have the opportunity to hear from two of our alums who have completed the program and were in the same exact position you were in during their respective year. And of course, we'll have time at the end for any burning questions you might have. So yeah, without further ado, I'll take this opportunity to introduce some of our staff on the Advocate Resources Training Team. For starters, like I mentioned, my name is Christina, and I'm a Training Programs Associate. I'm based in Houston, Texas, and I actually joined Shriver back in August, so this will be my first year uh, working with the new RJI cohort, so y'all already have a special place in my heart, and I look forward to seeing more of y'all throughout this um, year, and I'll pass it off to Generic. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, we can stop sharing slides here and just do webcams. Thanks so much. So um, as Christina mentioned, my name is Generic Holmes. I'm the director of the Racial Justice Institute at the Shriver Center on Poverty Law. I've uh, been with Shriver since about 2015. Shriver is headquartered in Chicago, Illinois, but I work from my home in Brooklyn, New York. And I just sort of echo Christina's enthusiasm for meeting you all and chatting with you all today. You know, really 2023 marks the 10 year anniversary of the Institute. So this is going to be like our 10 year cohort, um, which is like, just feels like a really big deal to us. <laughs> and um, so just excited to be here and share more about who we are, what we do, you know, how we view race and racism in, uh, in America. And I think that I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Kim, to share a little bit more about her and um, we'll go from there. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. I guess depending on where you are in the world, for most of you, it's afternoon. My name is Kimberly Merchant, and I am the Senior Director of the Advocate Resources and Training Department at the Shriver Center. Uh, most recently, the former director of the Institute. So I want you guys to give a shout out to Jay for his new position. He is our new director of the Institute. Yay! Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Give him some love. I'm really proud of him, and I know he's going to be great. Um, as Janera said, this is our 10 year. I, um, before coming to the Shriver Center in 2017, I worked at the Mississippi Center for Justice. I worked for my home in Greenville, Mississippi, and I was an advocate, uh, director of what was called Educational Opportunities in the state of Mississippi. Uh, and I was a part of the very first Racial Justice Institute in 2014. I um, went to the Institute and working in a space like Mississippi, I was very much aware of the young black boys that were coming through my doors day after day after day, being expelled and removed from the education system and had been fighting for them for years. No one had ever though gave me the tools or a roadmap, the direction around what does it mean to be a director of a statewide campaign? What does it look like to create strategies that, that um, produce the most impact? And what does it mean to explicitly lift up and talk about and address the racial disparities that exist in the work that I did? So it was like a light bulb moment for me, very transformative. So I was able to go back to Mississippi, um, change the game in terms of my direction and the way in which my team did our work. And so I believe in the Institute. After I completed it, I was a faculty member. I was on the advisory committee. I was on the selection committee. Um, so I played many roles, many, many. And then one day I got a call and said, you know, we're looking for a director, the Institute. We want to take it to the next level. We want um, someone to, to give it some direction. And would you apply? And I did. And so that's sort of how I became the first director of the Institute in 2017. So we're very um, pleased to have you guys here. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our space and to hopefully our next cohort um, we have some really exciting things planned for on site in June. We'll be able to come together. We'll do some stuff online, but we're coming together in June as a cohort. But also, we're going to merge that cohort with our network. Our network will be coming in partway through the week to meet everyone, and then we'll work collectively 
um, with folks across the country to talk about this work and what it means and looks like for us. So um, thank you, Jay, for giving me the space. Really looking forward to um, hearing your questions and, and excited about getting each of your applications. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. Yes, thank you, Kim. So now that you all got to learn a bit about us, we'd love to learn a bit about you. So I'm gonna be dropping in the chat a link to our Jamboard. And um, can you see my screen generic? Okay, but yes. So this is our Jamboard. You can go over to page two and yeah, we'd like for you to take this opportunity to introduce a little bit about yourself, your name and pronouns, your title, where you're from, what org you work at, and what are you hoping to learn more today? And of course, you're welcome to unmute yourself and to share with us in the group if you'd like. And so for oh, those and let me show you how to do this, my bad. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, to use Jamboard, we have a sticky note right here. You just click on it, type whatever you want, and then click save, and it'll get posted and just, um, you know, drag and drop wherever you'd like the sticky note to be. And let me know if you would like me to redo that again. Yeah, and I just want to uplift Kim's message in the chat pod. If you can't access the Jamboard um, or just for whatever reason, don't don't want to open another tab and take, take up internet capacity, uh, feel free to just put this information in the chat pod for us. We've got some Jamboard experts in the room. We're already done putting their intros on the screen. Thank you all so much. And so, so far on the board, we've got Cole from Texas Appleseed. He was in Austin, Texas. And then Carolina Estrada. Also got Wong. Am I saying that correctly? I hope so. Please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Who's the community engagement director, New Mexico Asian Families Center, Albuquerque, New Mexico? Here to learn about the program and whether it's a good fit for us. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, I hope that uh we're able to answer that question through our program. But as Christina just mentioned, there is ample room for questions today. Next up, we've got Paloma Dale. She, her staff attorney with Legal Services of, oh, of Oregon in Hillsboro, Oregon. Look forward to hearing from those who have been through the program. Yeah, well, um, I honestly, during this session, I always try my best to just get to them as quickly as possible. I feel like they're the superstars of this. <laughs> and then so, some folks are on the first page, just FYI, I did the same mm, thing, so <laughs> it's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks so much for that. Yeah. Um, so quickly from the chat, Jasmine Fells, Community Outreach Specialist, Contractor at USAO NDAL, Birmingham, Alabama. Okay. Interesting. Is that a union org? I'm not familiar with those acronyms. I'm just curious. And then to uplift some of what's coming in on our first screen here, got Maya from NILAG, New York Legal Assistance Group, wants to hear about the best ways to organize a team. We will definitely cover that. Um, so thanks for, for uplifting that. We've got a whole section on just sort of considerations, kind of an amalgamation of things that we have seen work in the past that we are going to share with you all. So thanks so much for um, putting these stickies in Jamboard. Keep them coming. We have a lot of room for questions today. Um, so it could be that we just sort of come back to some of these more granular questions uh, if we haven't answered them during our program today. So let me get my screen right so I can share my slides with you all. I will bump us ahead.
All right. So um, first things first, just want to set a little bit of context about who we are at the Schreiber Center. For those of you who may be unfamiliar, although I can see we definitely have a lot of Illinois family on the line. Um, so um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Shriver Center is headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. Our advocates fight for economic and racial justice by litigating, by shaping policy, and through programs like the Racial Justice Institute. RJI, the Racial Justice Institute, is housed within the Shriver Center's advocate resources and training department or team. Um, and our programs more broadly really are meant to build capacity for the broader anti-poverty, sort of anti-racism movement. I was just checking the chat, make sure nobody was having trouble hearing me. All right, and so then just kind of want to start out with a little bit of context about where we are as a society, sort of in this current moment. Uh, some of this is context setting, some of this is almost manifesting the future that we want to see, if you will. Um, but, you know, we're still sort of in this um, post George Floyd era, where we really did begin to see a shift in the narrative around racial justice in this country, around implicit bias and policing. Uh, and so we saw, you know, all of these different organizations um, beginning to release statements and affirm that Black Lives Matter. Uh, Mississippi changed their state flag to get rid of the Confederate emblem. Um, you know, but the question for us as racial justice advocates is how do we really transition this from a moment to a movement, right? How do we keep up the momentum uh, and make sure that this continues to be top of mind for folks so that we can get to the point where we're even beginning to uplift um, the fact that Native lives matter, and the fact that Native Americans are also killed by police at a disproportionate rate, um, and definitely more than their white counterparts. Um, and you know, because what we know uh, from history is that these racialized structures that oppress that murder uh, are really like intentionally built into the systems in America. Uh, America has really constructed and in many instances weaponized whiteness. Sorry, I was just checking the chat really quick. Um, and you know that that work, that intention um, through harmful practices such as redlining, which really begins to carve out opportunity for white folks and barriers for BIPOC people, um, it has a lot of grave implications for how we allocate taxes, uh, how local school districts are funded, uh, which it just starts this ripple effect, right? That impacts life expectancy and health outcomes. And so when this is the way that systems are intentionally set up and intentionally constructed, um, the way that we view it in RJI, like race neutral advocacy isn't the solution, right? That's not gonna solve the problem. And so I'm gonna switch gears right now. You know, in RGI, we will never talk at you. We really always wanna hear from you and our presentations are very interactive. So I'm gonna stop sharing this actually and take us back to our Jamboard. Hold on one second. My hot keys are um, like really sticky today. <laughs> it's taking like an extra second to get things up. Okay, so I'm gonna have you join me on our jam board on this page that I'm putting into the chat right now. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is just share with us like, where are you within your advocacy, within your communities, really seeing this correlation between uh, racial disparities and poverty? Uh, where are the racial inequities that, um, where do the racial inequities appear in, in your advocacy, in your community? So again, 
if you want to undock a sticky and paste your answer here, just go down to this fourth icon on the left hand side to undock it. Type here, and then you can hit enter or click save. And then I think I have some answers coming in in the chat as well, but I'm going to give you a moment for this. Okay, so got some things coming in via Jamboard. Somebody uplifted the sort of racial disparities in wealth building and wage gaps, right? Right. Limited access to affordable housing, especially in East St. Louis. Jobs allowed to mostly white hiring, white given preference positions. Okay, so some discrepancies in um, just hiring practices overall in this community. Somebody else uplifted safe and affordable housing. All of the listed bubbles, especially income, housing, policing, eviction crisis, and affordable housing, gender based violence, and language access, and affordable health care access. All right, thanks for this. I'm going to move to the chat. Just want to make sure I'm showing everybody a little bit of love here. And so from the chat, somebody that all of these sort of all of the the areas that are listed on the screen Jasmine Fell shares criminal justice resources and in, in the realm of oh in reentry yeah we see that one a lot right especially the way that reentry um really begins to impact your access to not only just getting a job but like getting housing right like it's really weaponized against you to almost just sort of force you back into going back into the, 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 the prison system, honestly. Okay, okay. Thanks so much for all of this. Please keep it coming in. Love to just sort of hear the nuances of your work um, and just what you all are seeing in your region. Like you're the experts in that work. Um, so love it when you bring it to our RJI sessions. So I'm gonna push us ahead so that we can get to our RJI fellows, our RJI superstars who have joined us for this webinar. I know everybody's anxious to hear from them. Okay. All right. And so thanks for doing that activity with me. Again, just always great to just sort of begin to pull your advocacy, pull what you're seeing in your community into this space um, to get just more full context for the fight that we are all engaged in. Um, and so, you know, for us at RJI, when we begin to define opportunity, it's really always in close proximity to a lot of the indicators that you uplifted um, to a lot of the indicators on the screen right now. And what we always see is that, you know, with all of these areas of opportunity, people of color, um, black folks, indigenous folks, people of color kind of always have less access, less, less access to food security, to affordable housing, as many people mentioned, um, lower life expectancy. And throughout our time in the Institute, we're gonna keep asking why, why is that? We're gonna keep digging deeper so that we better understand how these outcomes persist, even when we can't find an explicitly racist actor in these systems. And so I wanna shift gears just slightly to talk more about um, the Institute and um, just sort of share a little bit of uh, who comprised last year's Institute. And so this is a snapshot of our diverse cohort from 2022. Um, and then wanted to show you just a snapshot of where they were all from in the country to give you a better idea of um, just sort of how these cohorts are structured. I will say one unique thing about our 2022 cohort is that um, these are all folks um, who are like single organizational teams. Usually we end up with at least, I would say one or two sort of multi-organizational teams. And I just wanted to uplift that because that is an option. Like if you're already working with a community partner or you know, just like another local anti-poverty organization on some regional challenge, 
um, you could apply as a multi-org team. And so throughout our time together in RJI, we're gonna be focused together on these seven core competencies. Um, this is really, this is it. This is the bulk of what we teach. And we really define each of these in detail in the brochure that is sort of a part of our uh, 2023 application package. So you may have already read these definitions, but definitely have access to that information. I'm just gonna highlight a few of these. And, you know, really most importantly, we really begin RJI with this uh, foundational concept of structural racialization, um, which is really this framework that begins to help us understand and identify racism within the context of the work that we do. Uh, and really kind of a first step at identifying like where we're gonna intervene, like where is this racism erupting? Like racism can be and seem like such a large intractable problem. Uh, and so it's really meant to sort of give you the, the language, the analysis to be able to just really see like where it's popping up in a system. And then that foundational concept, structural racialization is really sort of undergirded and subvert, supported by social cognition and implicit bias. Um, and as such, you know, we as racial justice advocates, we wanna have a better understanding of our cognitive processes of the areas where our brains play tricks on us um, so that when we are uh, out and about in society and we see a black man or we see a Chinese person, like our, our brain is already telling us what that interaction is gonna be like and already shaping the way that we will treat that person. But we wanna be able to mitigate that. And so in the Institute, we teach key intervention um, and teach you how to really begin to map out a process um, so that you can debias not only organizational processes, um, but also these um, just sort of more granular interpersonal interactions that you that you have with folks. And then we also discuss systems thinking, which is really about just thinking about mapping a full system um, that your clients may be entrenched in and thinking about like where do you have leverage to make change? We also discuss framing and communications. Um, you know, typically, I'll use my I statements. Like, I mean, I was raised like not to talk about race, right? Like we have been indoctrinated into the system where we're just not supposed to mention it or talk about it. And as such, I think it can really just fall out of our vocabulary really easily. And we can even like not mention race when we're talking about racial justice advocacy. And so that whole session, that whole component is really meant to give you a framework, a set of tools that you can use to keep race as a part of the conversation, but do so in a way where you are framing your statement based on values so that you can mention race and can bring everybody along with you. And then finally, I'll mention leadership and organizational alignment. You know, that component, um, is really a small part of uh, the overall RJI experience. Uh, and I guess I just wanna say first off, like if you feel like you're only interested in the, sort of the leadership and organizational alignment piece of things, like if you're only interested in the sort of internal uh, part, you may wanna look at our website and look at our new course, Leadership for Racial Justice, um, which is being piloted right now. Our first public course is gonna be this fall. But I just wanted to highlight that because it's another resource and depending on the what, depending on what it is that you're trying to do, it could be a better fit for your org. Um, I would just encourage you to sort of review our website for more details. But that whole core practice is really just about just giving you some language and framework to advance uh, your internal race equity agenda. Um, and we're gonna say more about that a little bit later in the presentation, sort of this balance between internal and external. And so those core practices really help support the overall goals of the Institute. You know, advocates 
come to RJI, they learn these important concepts, skills, tools, uh, which expands their capacity to do race equity advocacy. They take all of that back to their orgs um, and really begin to sort of transform their internal processes in support of those broader external race equity goals, right? Like we, um, you know, our orgs really have to like practice what they preach and you really have to sort of sometimes clean up your own house before you go out into these communities and tell other folks what they need to be doing, right? Um, and then, you know, on the bottom here, we serve as the National Resource Center for Race Equity Advocates. We have a commitment to serve as a resource center for the RJI community, for the Institute and the, the sort of broader network, uh, which in turn just kind of builds this momentum and capacity for successful race equity initiatives around the country. So this is a snapshot of the 2022 schedule. This is also in that application brochure that I mentioned earlier. I think a couple of important things to highlight here, as Kim mentioned earlier, um, as a part of our 10 year celebration, um, we are gonna be on site together in Chicago this July, 11th to 14th. So, you know, folks from RGI 2023, in addition to um, paying per person to attend the Institute itself, that registration fee, um, you know, you'll also be responsible for getting yourself to Chicago and, uh, you know, booking your hotel. And um, the rest of this schedule, this is sort of all happening online. Um, and I'm sort of spending a little time here uplifting all of these little pieces um, because, it, you know, there's a big part of the application is really asking you and turning to you um, and challenging you to think about how you're going to make a time commitment for all of this. It's a really big commitment and it's not cheap either. Um, and so incumbent upon you is thinking about like, how are you going to fit all of this into your schedule? Uh, and so I think that's a conversation that you'll have to have with your organizational leadership. Uh, like how does this fit into your broader work plan? So in some ways, this is kind of a visualization of the schedule component, uh, but this is sort of more like the how. You know, in RJI, we have a, an action learning method. Uh, and this really begins with coming to us with a really strong uh, application, a really strong equity team project description in mind. Um, so, you know, you're going to be doing a lot of independent learning and readings, watching videos, reflecting, um, responding in discussion forums, uh, and then you will come to the live sessions, these interactive presentations, um, where you'll learn more deeply about these, these concepts. Uh, all of that is going to be applied into your small group conversations, where you're also getting to know your fellow cohort members um, and getting to understand the nuances of their work and um, the nuances of how they are analyzing these concepts and how they are beginning to apply what they are learning to what they, um, the issue that they brought to the Institute. You'll take all of that back with you to um, apply it and share it with your equity team, um, which sort of culminates in these various sort of reports that we have you turn into us and turn into your coaches. Um, and that really kind of gives us a goalpost, if you will, so that we at the Institute and your coaches really better understand um, what your needs are and where we may need to tweak things um, to make sure that you are getting the most out of your experience in the Institute and to make sure that you're leaving with a sustainable project in mind. And with that, I'm going to actually stop sharing here and turn it over to Christina, uh, who's going to share a video of some of our RGI alums. Really here, we're just trying to give you a feel for what people got out of the experience, um, like what the Institute has meant for these folks and their advocacy. And after that, we'll turn it over to our two live alums who are here to share their experience.
Racial Justice Institute is a collective of attorneys from across the nation. What makes us unique is that we take more of a legal approach, understanding that that legal approach can only be successful if it's done with, with the community. You, you take this huge problem, which is like racism, which, you know, how do you really begin to combat that? And really like sit down with a piece of paper, <laughs> with a problem in the middle, with all of these different arrows. And it's like, all right, I'm going to look at these like four dynamics and think about like, who are the actors in these systems? Like, what's your local tipping point? Like, who are going to be your partners in making sure that we are uplifting people of color? For me, being part of the Racial Justice Institute, you know, it's a very hopeful space. You know, a lot of people are in this moment where they're really questioning, like, what are the right strategies? Because there are so many of us now who've graduated from different cohorts across the entire country in different practice areas, we're able to connect with each other and communicate about the work that we're doing. And so we can find more opportunities for intersectional work. It has given me a set of tools that have just sharpened my race equity work, but really my work as a legal services attorney. And so for me, even though it's an incredibly challenging place, the more challenging thing you know, for me is when you're doing just one individual case after the other. Being a community lawyer means learning when to listen. So you really have to suspend that lawyer hero ideal. It is so important to acknowledge your own implicit bias when you are doing this work. I have peers that I look up to and contact on a regular basis. I have people to call if I have challenges. So there's no better time to engage in race equity work or race justice work than today because people are paying attention. It can be very easy to get stressed out and bogged down by the work that you're doing. It feels like there are crises happening every single day and sometimes you wonder what difference does my work in one case matter when everyone else is still going to be suffering and everyone else is still going to be affected by these really racist policies. So by being able to look at it through a bigger picture lens, I'm able to see the value of my work. The work is really hard. Um, it's, it's hard to see inequities and the effect that they have on people in, in really disenfranchised and marginalized groups. And so so it is, it's really difficult to do it every day and to still keep like having passion about it and still being able to give to your clients and so talking to people who get it and who support you is, is really meaningful. So we're creating a space where when we feel the most hopeless, we can come together, just be with each other and encourage one another. and continue that shared understanding that we do have the tools to fight this, and we will. We are the movement. We are strong together. We are unapologetic about addressing race. We're the movement. We are the movement. We are the movement! Oh, thanks so much for that, Christina. And um, yeah, so, Kind of continuing that same theme, we wanted to make sure that you could hear from the perspective of a couple of RGI alums, like just what this experience meant for them, their program, their advocacy, um, sort of uh, in that moment when they when they joined us. And so I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. And so I'll start with Denny, um, who can introduce himself and just kind of share with you all a little bit about um, his equity team project equity team and just how it unfolded. Great. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you for your interest in the RGI experience. And thank you to the Schreiber team for inviting me to speak about um, our experiences. My name is Denny Chan. I'm um, a managing director for equity advocacy at Justice in Aging, um, formerly the National Senior Citizens Law Center. We are a national organization um, that is dedicated to using the power of law to fight senior poverty. We serve as a resource center um, and a technical assistance center for legal services attorneys who provide services to older adults um, across the country. And I am based in California using he, him, his pronouns. Um, before I dive into kind of our project and what we did, and the lessons that we learned, I really want to take a moment to um, recognize the incredible um, impact of the mass shootings um, earlier this week. Um, as someone who is based in California with ties to Monterey Park, um, it's been a tough week. But so I wanted to start off recognizing that and knowing that um, many of us are holding that in this space. Um, so for many, many years, Justice and Aging, we have had an internal 
Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee that was focused on the nuts and bolts of um, equity with respect to our organization. So looking at hiring, looking at recruitment, looking at um, how we respond to awful events in the world um, and supporting staff. Um, and as an organization that uh, was looking at poverty issues for low-income older adults, I think we'd always had a gap for how we think about race equity in our work. Um, we operated, I think many of us, uh, on a myth that our work around poverty issues was inherently race equity work um, without really understanding the more complicated nuances of why that might be a more interesting Venn diagram as opposed to synonymous with each other. Um, and I think for many, many years, we knew that the people we were helping were largely disproportionately low-income older adults of color. Um, but we really struggled with how to center that in our advocacy. So I, I think about like a typical issue brief that we would write. And we would say X number are, you know, black older adults, 65 and up. And then we would do our sort of regular practice of walking through our, our bread and butter of, you know, talking about policies, talking about programs, and then identifying policy solutions. And it was as if the front of the horse were completely divorced from the back of the horse. When we got to the recommendations, we talked about these programs, we were no longer thinking about the people, but we were in the nitty gritty sub-regulatory guidance released by CMS or whatever it might be. And so to, we knew that that was a gap in our advocacy, that we would identify the population on the front end and not really address them in our policy solutions. So that was really why we applied for RJI in the first place. Um, so I was a part of the 2019 cohort um, and our project, it, the team was myself at the time I was um, on our health team and working on issues for um, people dually eligible with Medicare and Medicaid, as well as our deputy director. And it was really important for us, um, I know we'll talk more about sort of teams later, but it was really important for us to have the deputy director involved in the team because from her position, Jennifer's position, she wasn't just thinking about our health teamwork. She was thinking across the organization, where can we take these tools? And I know people have already started talking about the tools. Where can we take these tools and bring them back across the organization to support our entire staff? Um, whereas sort of my perspective was really thinking about the health team. And so our project kind of had this like external facing component around um, home and community-based services for older adults. We knew there was a lot of research showing that um, Black and Latino older adults are admitted to nursing facilities at higher rates um, than their growth in the general population. And um, we suspected that that was because their access to services to keep them at home was, um, was that there were barriers to that access um, based on race. And so that was kind of our specific project. And then Jennifer's sort of uh, my teammate's position was to really think through how we can take this one piece and get our other program teams working on it. Um, so in terms of some key lessons for us, um, you know, I think there's been, someone has already mentioned that the application process takes some time. The, uh, the Institute itself takes some time. There's like pre, you know, pre-Chicago work, then you're on site in Chicago, and then there's plenty of work after you meet in Chicago. Um, and I think for us, you know, one of our big takeaways was that that time was really worth it. Um, that when you're thinking about, you know, and we did, we had to sit down, Jennifer and I sat down, we took things off of our plates to be able to make time for the investment um, for the Institute. And then, you know, we saw how that transformed our organization. So um, Jenneric had mentioned George Floyd, you know, we participated in the Institute in 2019 came back, did a bunch of work with our staff. And then we found ourselves in this sort of the country as the country found itself in this race reckoning period. Um, and so using the tools that Shriver gave us through RJI, we actually launched a specific equity initiative um, focused really on advancing race equity for older adults of color. And the success of that initiative, being able to start it up, being able to work with our staff on that, being able to communicate about that, being able to, all those different things 
in large part was because of our experience with the Racial Justice Institute. I don't think, I, I can credibly say we would not be where we are today in our development as an organization, in our development of our staff thinking about race equity in their work without RJI. Um, so we continue to, you know, and the other piece around the time piece is like, it's not a one and done deal. Um, we continue to work on our project, Home and Community Services um, for Older Adults when we came back, we launched this initiative and we're still learning. Like we just sent, I think, three more staff through the foundations class last fall. Um, and we just did an all, all staff training around some tools and ideas that we got in our JI around the iceberg model, around targeted universalism. These are all concepts we got in our JI and we have to continue to work with them in our work. Um, and then we're also just last year, launched a new project where we're bringing some of that to legal services providers who work with older adults and really getting them to think about the intersection of ageism and racism in their work, those structural barriers that that creates. Um, and then the last lesson before, you know, I know I want to give um, other folks time and also if there's time for questions and answers. Um, the other lesson is that the network is truly an invaluable resource. Um, it's not just the tools that you're going to get during and offsite, onsite, it's the group of people that um, you find yourselves in company with afterward. Um, I am regularly emailing the RGI listserv. We post our job postings there, and we have, in fact, recruited people who've gone through the Institute because we want them to be able to hit the ground running with respect to their understanding and um, use of the tools. All of that speaks to, I think, speaks volumes to how much we um, think about RGI as a very pivotal experience, um, a crucial experience in our own organization's race equity journey. Um, so I know that you know there's limited time, so I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time and also look forward to questions and answers. Thank you so much, Denny. Yeah, so we'll pivot to Latoya, and then I think we'll definitely have time to Turn to the audience for questions if people want to ask questions of the two of you. Hello, all. I just want to at first um, say thank you to RJI for um, extending the opportunity for me to share my experience. I'm always really excited and eager to share my experience um, through RJI with others because it was such a pivotal, pivotal. Um, pivotal experience, um, not only for me, but um, also just in my organization work. And so I just want to again, thank them for allowing me to um, share. Um, so I am the uh, founder and director of the Race Equity and Corrections Initiative at Prisoner Legal Services of Massachusetts. Um, Prisoner Legal Services um, was formerly known as the Massachusetts Correctional Legal Services, was established in 1972 to protect and promote the civil and constitutional rights of Massachusetts prisoners. Um, we provide legal assistance through litigation, um, informal advocacy or in individual advocacy, um, as well as uh, legislative initiatives and also providing advice to prisoners and their families. Um, when I initially came into PLS, I was the first African-American um, attorney hired in the organization since its inception in 1972. Um, Oh, I apologize. I did forget to give my pronouns, she and her. Um, and uh, also, um, I came in as a staff attorney. So as a result of my involvement, however, with RJI, I was able to create this um, program. And now I am uh, not only directing work that is near and dear to me, but I am also supervising a team of um, individuals who are also assisting with that work. Um, so just to um, talk initially about my experiences through the um, RJI um, cohort, when I came in, it was during the height of um, COVID and also George Floyd. Um, I can admit that I think I was um, very exhausted, kind of disgruntled, um, uh, I, I think it's fair to say also angry and just really had like this feeling, extreme 
feeling of exhaustion and hopelessness. And I did not know how RJI could actually um, assist me in my work because I felt like, you know, I am actually living this. So what can an institution teach me about experiences that I live day to day? Um, and so I kind of came in a little reluctant, but just really um, acknowledging that this work was so important to the clients that I serve and very um, necessary for the organization. So I initially came in with one other team member from my organization and um, our um, project was focused on um, community engagement. So we wanted to be able to establish relationships with um, incarcerated family members. Um, and so that was a, a very kind of limited scope. But as I uh, began to learn more, particularly what always stands out um, to me most about my experience in RJI is the section where we learned about systems thinking. It was at that point that the light bulb went off. And um, although my my project has really morphed, um, which with every year, I will say that do not come into this expecting to complete your project, expecting to complete the work within the time that you're um, within RJI. Uh, it's not realistic. Um, I can't tell you how many times um, our project ideas changed, but I can tell you that um, we are in such an amazing place now with the work and it continues to actually change every year. So I'll tell you about my work. Um, the work that I do uh, through REICI, which again is Race Equity and Corrections Initiative, we um, not only um, acknowledge and identify, but we are also challenging the uh, desperate impact on black and brown prisoners in the day-to-day -day operations of corrections. Um, the reason why that work is so difficult is because no state in the country mandates the collection of specific racial demographics. So we didn't have any data whatsoever um, in order to really be able to not only acknowledge, but to challenge um, the things that were occurring with, with our clients. And so, um, again, utilizing the, the many tools that RJI was able to provide me, I was able to um, come up with the idea to survey uh, clients and just thinking about those various tools um, gave me the uh, the idea about just systems that we needed to identify within that survey. And we uh, surveyed 1,500 Black and Brown prisoners um, and was able to set foundation for what um, eventually kind of morphed into other projects. So we're now, uh, we developed an internal um, processes as, in addition to the external processes. So we are also, um, auditing, we audited the organization. And uh, thanks to my kind of push and commitment to the work, we were able to bring in race equity facilitators who were able to change our policies. Our leadership um, structure was changed. So now more BIPOC staff are able to be placed in positions of leadership. Um, we were also able to um, in incorporate uh, uh, caucus work, and that's something else that we learned through um, RJI. So we now have uh, both a BIPOC and white caucus. Um, and all of these resources were really essential to being able to relate with our clients, which um, the majority of which are, are BIPOC. Um, I do think, uh, as Denny mentioned earlier, just the myth that because you work with individuals who are um, underprivileged, you automatically assume that you're doing the work and that you're intentional with that work. And that was certainly not the case. So I'm um, learning and understanding what um, intentional race equity work looks like um, is, is a, a process that our organization, that my organization has undergone. Um, in terms of the external work, um, I, um, just on the 20th was able to file a bill which um, I uh, drafted and again using a lot of the tools that um, I learned from RJI I was able to um, gain sponsorship from two legislators both in the House and the Senate 
for um, a bill that will be the first um, of its kind if it is passed in the country, which would institute um, and correctional oversight that would specifically incorporate um, minimum anti-racism standards within the Department of Corrections, as well as requiring them to gather that specific race equity data that, that I mentioned before, which would allow us to then begin to better challenge um, some of the, the happenings that are um, that our clients are experiencing on a regular basis. So I'm really uh, excited about that bill. And um, my project, I have also, again, just speaking about how your project will continuously kind of develop and morph into something else. Um, I have also been able to incorporate an additional project called the Prisoner Empowerment Project. And that project is, um, I noticed someone mentioned community lawyering in, in the chat. It's more along the lines of recognizing that our clients are in fact the experts of their own experiences and the importance of centering um, those who are most impacted at the, at the decision-making tables. And so we um, actually have employed individuals who are currently incarcerated um, to engage in our work. They um, not only act as liaisons, but they also provide us with a lot of um, just uh, direction about our litigation, about various projects that we take on. So we right now are, um, we have employees within six different facilities and um, we are uh, actively working with those individuals and also paying them a minimum wage, which is um, a, a huge considering that uh, prisoners generally are, you know, they're, they're paid slave wages. Um, so the fact that we're able to provide that funding and provide that opportunity and then again, just valuing those individuals who have been impacted is um, something that, you know, we're really uh, proud of. And again, a lot of this, I, um, give thanks to RJI for that experience and allowing this work to really come to fruition. So I, I wanna leave a room for, for questions. So I guess I'll, I'll wrap up there, but certainly if anyone has any questions or anything, please feel free to uh, ask. Thank you so much, Latoya. So, I mean, we really have time for, we have time for questions here. If you have questions about these specific projects or um, just wanna chat with, Denny and Latoya, and then you know we're going to share some equity team project considerations, and then we have time for questions after that as well. Just want to assure folks there's all the room in the world to to chat with us about about what's on your heart. If nobody has questions for Denny or Latoya, we could keep going, and you could put them in the chat, and we could come back to them. If, if anything comes up for you. It looked like Maya had a question. I you know what, her. I'm realizing, I don't know if my question is just for them, um, but I'll throw the question out there and then generic, you can tell me if it's if it's for these folks or if you wanna save it for later, but it has to do with the scope of the project. Cause I've heard you both talk a little bit, especially Latoya, you were talking about how the project changed over time. And I guess I had a question for generic also. We were thinking that the scope should maybe be a little bit broad because we want to apply what we learned through the fellowship to kind of where there's like, if the overall topic that we're looking at is racial inequities, we're looking at um, in New York City Housing Authority, there are some sub, there are some sub issues. And I'm just wondering, do we need to pick a sub issue? Or we can we consider a range of issues in the project? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, I mean, that's a great question. I think maybe we should move on to this next bit and we could come back to that. I, I mean, I, I think maybe it sort of begs broader questions about what those sub issues are. Um, I just think it's a bit of a longer conversation because some pieces of it are about even like what is the team composition, right? Like who are the advocates that you think are gonna be working on this? Like are, are those advocates most um, have, do they have the most expertise in those sub issues or do they have the expertise that will help them advance this sort of broader project? Um, so I, I don't know. I feel like I have more questions for you and um, maybe we could move on to this next section and come back totally to that fine. actually. Totally fine. Um, hold on one second, let me. While you're doing your slides, I just want to speak to, to Maya's question. I think it's in both 
Um, you'll have to decide what makes the most sense. Sometimes it's good to start broad because then you can examine the entire system. And, and they were talking about systems thinking it's really about how do you select which issue to work on? Um, or if you have a specific issue that you want to drill down deeper into, then you could select that. So I would leave that up to you guys, whether you want to take a broader approach or whether you want to come in with a more drill down specific issue. Thanks. That's helpful. Um, okay. And so just to push us ahead um, so that we can get to that section where we kind of get more granular about these equity team projects and team composition and, and all that fun stuff. Um, just want to kind of highlight um, what supports the, the network provides for you all, like after the formal institute wraps. And I know um, Denny mentioned the network. I think Latoya did. And you even sort of saw uh, in the video, Dorian get teary and kind of talk about how lonely the work is. And I would say that the, the network itself is meant as a sort of support system. So the work doesn't feel so lonely um, so that you can connect with others who are facing similar challenges. Um, and so, you know, these are some of the areas um, of support, if you will. Uh, as Denny mentioned, we have a very active listserv uh, where folks uh, share resources, just kind of provide peer support, uh, ask questions, pitch ideas for ongoing webinars, um, and just sort of generally stay in touch with each other. And like Jen Denny mentioned, also share job postings. Um, and then, you know, we have a periodic RGI newsletter where we share stories of success um, just to kind of help people understand what's going on within the network. What are people working on? How are their projects morphing, advancing? How are people continuing to use these tools um, to mitigate various uh, regional challenges? And then I'll say more about some of the other buckets on these next slides. We do currently have an RGI network website. We're in the process of archiving everything there and switching to another platform. We were sort of forced to move. Um, I just got expensive in that neighborhood. <laughs> we're looking for another home. Um, so just want to throw that out there that this sort of online repository of, you know, tools, resources, frameworks um, is something that we will continue to provide folks. Um, as we have uplifted a few times during this session, we're going to be having our uh, third RJI Network convening this summer, July 13th and 14th in Chicago, Illinois, a chance for the full network to get together. Um, so there will be more information to come on that for those who decide to apply. And then uh, just kind of want to give you a snapshot of where this network is in the country. As you will see, there are some gaps, which I'll talk about in a moment when we move on to talking about some of our um, um, just sort of our recruitment wish list for the year. But before that, I'm actually going to pitch things off to Kim to begin to share some application considerations. Yeah, so as you're thinking about applying to the Institute, there are just three big bucket items that we wanted to give people more context around as you're preparing for it. The first is team selection. This is a question that comes up quite a bit. Um, we do want you to be very thoughtful about your team. I'm going to go into them Okay, so we're going to talk about team selection. Organizational support, which is critical, because if the folks at the top aren't supporting it, then everything that you learn when you come back sometimes um, crumbles. <laughs> so it's important to have organizational support. And then, of course, your equity team project. So the first consideration is team member selection. Um, advances, thank you. So team member selection is critical because we want you to be very thoughtful about who you invite to be a part of your team. Um, and we found in previous years, sometimes when it's hodgepodge, you're, you're just pulling people and there's no thought into it. Then when it comes time to do your equity team project, there tends, there tends to be problems. So we are looking for teams, first of all, that are diverse. So you want to think about how do I have a diverse team, both, of course, racially, by gender, um, and um, able-bodied, positional authority. So just the different aspects. So we don't... You know, we will and we have selected them, but does your team need all attorneys on it, for instance? Who else in your organization touches on this work that makes it make sense? Um, and we want you to be very creative. Generic was saying before last year, we end up with all teams, organizational teams, which is okay. But we really like to see 
teams with um, community-based organizations associated with it or another maybe a legal aid or social justice organization that you work with. People, are, we've had statewide teams where there's been like eight or nine people from eight or nine different organizations. So it can look very differently. So just be creative and innovative about what makes the most sense for your team. If I am, we're focusing on this issue, housing, like uh, Maya brought up before, who are the people that can really help me brainstorm and come up with the best solutions around an equity team project that I work with? That might be just people in your organization, that's okay. But if there's others outside your organization, feel free to invite them to the party. We think that will be great. Um, and then any application is gonna ask you, so be prepared to, what does each of the individual team members that you've selected contribute to your equity team project and contribute to the team? So we wanna know uniquely, this person brings this to the table, this person works directly with community and so they have their ear to the ground. This person is an expert in this field so they can provide a sort of the legalese around this. You know, why are these people being invited to be a part of your team? How do they make your team stronger? And how do they also help create the cohesion around the project that you want to work in? The second application consideration is the organization support and structure. I brought this up earlier. Um, we found that organizations who have a strong commitment to race equity tend to really uh, be the best spaces for our alumni. And we have some alumni who come to RJI, run all these great ideas and go back to the organization, fired up and ready to apply. And then they hit a brick wall because folks don't understand the experience that they've been through in the Institute. And it's particularly when you're working with folks who have not had the same experience. So they don't know, like, I don't know how to supervise somebody who's doing race equity advocacy because I don't have the same tools that they learn. So be sure that you think about that both in the development of your team structure, but also making sure that you're communicating with your um, senior leadership because organizational support is critical. And there's actually a letter that um, someone on your senior management team has to sign that says, we support our applicant in this effort. We will give them the time and space to participate fully in the Institute. Um, and we are excited about them bringing back all these great tools to our organization. So it's gonna, uh, organizations that have a foundation around race equity tend to, to, to fare better and have better results from the Institute. So that's something that we look for in the application as well. And then finally, um, the last consideration, of course, is your equity team project. This is a big one. Um, <clears throat> in years past, some people have suggested internal projects, meaning they want to work internally and that's okay. And some have wanted to do external projects. This year, it's going to be important that each team um, configure an external project idea if your team wants to do an internal and external project, that's fine, but an external project idea will be um, required. And when we say external team projects, I, I always give you two tips. It's either something that you currently work on, but you may not be doing it with that race equity lens, so you wanna see what that looks like because then you already know everything you need to know foundationally about the project. Now you're just working to how do I how do I address the disparities in the system that I'm that I'm working in? And then secondly, something that's just bugged you to death. Like I've been doing this work and I've seen this happen and I really want to address it, but haven't had the chance to do it. That also makes a really great equity team project. When you craft your project idea, make, make sure that you include in there, what are you, what's the problem you're trying to address and what's the outcome you would like to see? And more importantly, what is the disparity or disproportionality that you're addressing in your project? This community is being impacted in a particular way. I really want to understand and address why these particular people are being um, disproportionately impacted. So think about that and articulate that in your, um, in your application. That makes for a really great equity team project idea. And that's one of the things that the selection committee will be looking at when they select, um, select teams. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you. Yeah, so just really quick to wrap up here, just wanted to share some of our recruitment priorities. Earlier, I framed this as a wish list. Uh, so these aren't mandatories, but as always, want to have as diverse a cohort as possible. And that means, you know, having more folks across the country who bring different perspectives uh, around this work. So looking to kind of fill in some of these gaps. Um, so looking for um, advocates from Mississippi, West Virginia, Arkansas, Kentucky. Um, I mean, y'all can read all the states that you see here. Um, we just have um, don't have any advocates in, in most of these states. Kim's kind of holding it down for Mississippi. 
But uh, for most of these other states, we just don't have any any fellows and would love to just spread the tools um, and bring their unique perspective to bear in the network. Um, and then so also looking to fold in more advocates who do uh, you know health advocacy, health law, uh, sort of work within the criminal justice system, uh, who do environmental law or uh, elder law, um, people who do sort of like Native American rights work, disability justice work, voting rights law, and then looking to work with more people who are themselves uh, men of color, who are themselves Native or Indigenous, immigrant, um, and then we need more trans folks in our uh, network as well to continue to just have more diversity. I just want to end really quick before we move on to questions with just a quick snapshot of the overall timeline. Uh, right now, we're just in our open call for applications period, but the deadline to submit your application is like, I would say midnight of February 28th. Uh, and then in March, we're going to be meeting with our selection committee who really help us score these applications and um, think about, you know, who's a good fit based on the equity team projects put forth within these applications. And so then if you apply, you can expect a response uh, March 22nd through March 24th. Um, those acceptance notifications will be going out then via email. And then we would need like um, just uh, affirmation and need to start to get payments, bios, and headshots from you by March 27th. So just be aware of that sort of tight timeline on acceptance payments um, and understand that you need to just sort of get back in touch with us as soon as possible after we accept you. Cause there's often a wait list of other applicants who are um, also just sort of ready to join. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing these slides and just sort of open it up for questions. And I realize there may be some in the chat here. I just can't get to it. Hold on. I have a quick question to start it off. Um, so at Texas Appleseed, we have a plethora of different project areas and there's numerous people across different project areas who have expressed interest in doing the program. So I'm with the Criminal Justice Project. We have somebody from Fair Financial Services. We have somebody uh, from Juvenile Justice, from Community Organizing. So I'm wondering is, is it okay to have a variety of team members who have different project area backgrounds or expertise? Is that, would that be like an obstacle for doing this? I don't think it's an obstacle at all. Um, I mean, I think, you know, you will all will just have to figure out a project where, where all that expertise can come to bear, where all of that expertise has value and all that expertise helps you all sort of get to that end goal. Um, like, is it a criminal justice focused project that somehow has a huge community organizing component uh, <laughs> and that person plays okay. a, a large role in helping, you know what I mean? Like okay. <laughs> how, how will each of those people really help you get to that goal? Cause I will say, you know, one thing that we've seen is, you know a bunch of folks from across an org get together, they pick an education project. Only one of them is an education advocate and it kind of just ends up being that person's project and like they have to do the bulk of the work um, because other people just don't do that that advocacy and so just don't want you to end up in a position where um you don't have the support that you need uh, okay. from your team members okay. to advance things so it's not a bad idea you just sort of have to think about how you want to pull it together and what the project is mm -hmm. um and i'll say for everybody here you know i mean we're definitely open to um, just having calls with you to discuss like your ideas for a project, just sort of where you're headed and, um, you know, maybe even just sort of have a bit of a brainstorming session. Kim and I don't sit on the selection committee. Uh, we like moderate those meetings and facilitate them, but um, we're sort of recuse ourselves from the process, uh, which I think allows me to, to sit in on these brainstorming sessions with you um, in a way that feels like clean and ethical. because. Uh, you know, we just want you to come with the strongest project possible to RJI. So does that mean then that I there was some confusion from some of the other people on my team about the application when we submit it? Are we submitting these individually? Or do we submit them as a team? Right? That's a great question. Okay. 
Uh, individually, yeah, we okay. want to hear from each person's perspective, like what their expertise will mean for this project. Okay. And each team member gets um, this sort of a scale we use gets um, rated individually as well as the team collectively. It's part of the process. Okay, so cool. we look at we look at both. Um, someone, Sabrina asked how many people teams or projects will be selected. Our range is somewhere between 40 to 45 total people. And how many teams that encompasses really just is based on um, who we select. So we, we always hit about 40, but we'll go as far as 45, depending on how many great applications we get. Um, but how many teams we get is really just depending on the applications. It's normally somewhere between 10 to 12 teams. We had as many as 13 and as, as few as nine teams collectively, because we have like a really big team, of course, then the total teams will be a little less. That answer your question, Sabrina? Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Somebody yes. also asked about the recording. Today's um, session will be sent to anyone who's registered, whether they attend it or not. I have another question. Can I jump in? Yeah. Um, so this has to do with the size of the team. Um, we are considering a project that involves um, two kind of departments working together. And so we would want a representative from each of those departments, but then we're also considering having people who are more, whose responsibilities are more organizational wide, in part for some of the reasons that Denny was suggesting that we want to maximize and really take the tools and kind of maximize it throughout. Is it okay? We would end up having a larger team. So we were thinking about four people or could even be five people. But if you tell us that's not wise, you know what, we would incorporate that. So I just wanted to hear what you all think about that. Four or five is the regular size. Most average teams are like three or four people. So four or five is, is not bad. But we've had teams as large as nine people, nine or eight people. Usually those are um, across organizations. But if you can make the case, <laughs> that you need all these people in your application and we'll, we'll accept them all. Or if your equity team project is just so fabulous or the applications are just so fabulous, we'll, we'll take them all. So yeah, four or five does not scare us at all. That's a good team. Thank you. All right, there's, should we be uh, in agreement on the topic before submitting the yeah. application? Um, yes. yes, that's a good idea because what we're looking for also when we review the application is have y'all even gotten together and talked about this? So we want to be clear that you guys have sort of gotten together. But if you have, for instance, the team has different ideas around what the project could be, um, you want everyone in their application to sort of acknowledge that. But if there's a particular team member that want to focus on one area versus another, um, you can also talk about that. But a lot of people, and it's okay to do this as well, this comes up literally come up with their project ideas collectively. They work out how they're going to talk about an application and they cut and paste it. So there's like repetition in each application around what the equity team project is. And that is okay. It's not a, you know, some people think, oh, can we cut and paste? That might look bad. We do not reflect poorly on those questions that are like team related questions in the application. If they're cut and paste, that's okay. I also want to point out that the equity team project is not a contract. So if you select a particular project and we select you for the Institute and then your team decides you want to do something completely different, we're okay with that. It is an iterative process. And as you go through the Institute, it will shift and change. And sometimes people do completely different ideas than what they started with. So don't, I don't want you to feel like that um, whatever project you propose, like we're just going to hold your feet to the fire on and say, this is what you said you're going to do. And now you're not doing it. Yeah, no, we don't do that because we do understand and we want you to have the flexibility and room to grow and shift and evolve. Thanks for that, Kim. Any other questions? Cole has a question in the chat. Just to confirm, is it a requirement for someone with a JD to be a part of the team? Yes. Yes, at least one person needs to be a lawyer or have gone to law school. My, um, you know, this session's very in length. 
Um, at the beginning, they're kind of long days, like we're together online for five hours. There are a lot of breaks, um, a lot of long breaks, but cumulatively we're together for, for five hours. Once we get to part three, um, every other, like every month we meet once for about two hours. So it really dropped off after on-site. But then you need to be like meeting more with your equity team, uh, meeting more with, with your, and then touch more with your coaches and really refining your project. So you leave with something sustainable. So I would say the time commitment shifts there. <laughs> All right, well, I'm free to hang out if folks have more questions, but otherwise we will follow up with, um, we'll just email you all the link to the recording, the slides, um, and some just sort of informative links to make sure that you understand where important, important pieces of the application are. Let's stop. And Christina, you can stop sharing slides. Thank you so much. <laughs>